Well, we're going to jump in, and we're going to be at John chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 22. If you have a Bible, open it up, or otherwise in the chair back in front of you, or I guess underneath the chairs, there are Bibles at the Welcome Center. You can always, if you don't have it, uh, you can open up something on your phone. Uh, UVersion is a great Bible app. If you've got an iPad, iPhone, whatever, Android, uh, UVersion is a great way to get there. But it's going to be John chapter 3, and we're going to be verses 22 through 36. Uh, your bulletins, I suspect, say the wrong thing because I realized late last night that I emailed Trish and sent her a typo that says 22 through 26. It's 22 through 36, and that's my doing, not Trish's fault, so don't blame her. Um, I, I, I realized that as I looked at the title page of my sermon, I was like, oh, I goofed that up, and I'm sure I messed her up with that. Uh, if you didn't find it and you want to follow along, there are sermon notes in your bulletins as well. Well, I'm going to read this passage to you, and then we're going to jump in. Uh, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth book in the New Testament, uh, fourth of the Gospels, and it's going to be John starting in verse 22, and you'll see it on the screen here as well. And there it reads, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them, baptizing. John, John the baptizer, John was also baptizing in the Anon near Selim. Uh, because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized. John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing, unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I have said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides or remains on him. Now many of you would be familiar with uh, C.S. Lewis. You know, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. They made those into movies recently. But he's probably most famously known for his, his book, Mere Christianity. And uh, that started off, if you're not familiar with Mere Christianity, as a set of, uh, a series of, radio presentations that he did back uh, during the time of World War II in England. C.S. Lewis, of course, was British. And uh, he, he spoke some words in that book, if you've not read it before, that, that speak to this passage, I think, uh, very clearly about how, how Jesus and how some people want to relate to Jesus simply as a great moral teacher. And Lewis says, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis goes on to say, that is the thing, the one thing, that we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says, I am a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Lewis says, you must make your choice. Either this man, Jesus, was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. 
Do you see what Lewis is saying? He's saying Jesus cannot possibly simply be a, a great moral teacher because of the very things that Jesus said, because of the things that he claimed about himself. And, and you see, he's saying he is so much more than that, in fact. Much, much more than that. He is the Son of the living God who demands our worship. And it's over that, that very issue now that a debate, a, a discussion, an argument develops between Son of John, John the Baptist's disciples and followers and, and some certain Jewish man. We don't know the identity of this Jewish man. It just makes a, 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 a kind of sideways reference that he's in the story. He gives us no details. But th they're having this conversation. It's over ceremonial washings and, and the meaning and the importance and the consequences of these washings and, and perhaps their relationship to, to John's baptism. Because see, John was baptizing people uh, in the name of repentance. And, and, and then... Also within that, now Jesus is performing baptisms. And so, so there's this dis discussion that's going on. And, and you can imagine as this discussion is going, how it might be going. And, and, and these guys, these, these followers of John, you know, they come to John the Baptist because it, it seems in this story that some of John's disciples have, uh, so to speak, kind of jumped ship and, and gone over to Jesus. And, and, and these followers of John are saying, John, it kind of looks like he's getting to be more popular than you. And, and uh, okay, what do we do here, right? And you see, John the Baptist was a, was a great teacher, a great preacher. John was a man of extraordinary ability, of, of liveliness and freshness and vitality and energy for the Word of God. And he loved the, the truth about who he was to be and who Jesus was in coming. And, and he loved to share that. And he was excited about the coming kingdom of God. And, and you see, many, many people had already given part of their lives and become disciples of John. They've been, been following John around now. But all of a sudden now, some guys like Andrew and, and, and Simon Peter, these are the guys who, who, who left John the Baptist. And now, uh, instead, they're following Jesus. And so if you're, if you're a disciple of John's, you can imagine now there's beginning to be this feeling, this sense of maybe rivalry between John's disciples and those guys who are following Jesus. And, and there's kind of these feelings that might be developed. And, and it's an immensely important point in the story about the life of Christ here. Because if John hadn't dealt with this well and the way in which he deals with it, there was potential at this point for enormous damage to the movement of Christ and, 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 and consequences that we can't even imagine if John didn't handle this conflict well. And it's to John's eternal credit that he deals with this sense of rivalry and this tension that's building between his disciples and Jesus' disciples. It's to his credit that he deals with it in the way that he does. And I want us to, to look at that together. If you're following along in your notes, this is your first note in your sermon notes. The only focus of the believer's life is the glory of Jesus. You see, what John does is a very simple thing. He turns his entire focus upon Jesus. He believes that Christ must fill our vision. And, and I want to see that with you in, in the verses 27 through 30. And, and I don't really want to overly psychoanalyze this passage or whatever, but in a sense it's almost impossible not to do that to some level. Because there's this tension in the Scripture. There's this, as you read this passage, there's this sense of, of, of rivalry, right? And so these, these guys are sensing some tension and rivalry between John the Baptist and Jesus and the two groups of followers. And this is one team and that's the other team. And we've got to have more baptisms than those guys, right? You know, we're, it's a competition. Guys make everything into a competition, right? We do. That's just, I don't know what it is about us, but that's the way we were wired, I guess. And so just the same with these dudes. They're feeling kind of the competitive urge and they want to be bigger, better, stronger, faster than Jesus and his disciples, apparently. And now there really isn't, 
if you understand this, there truly really isn't a conflict here. But nonetheless, these disciples are, are feeling like there is. And John has been repeatedly, repeatedly deflecting, right? If you know the story, we've been studying this here for a little while. John keeps saying, I'm not the Christ, right? I'm not the Messiah. I'm just the forerunner. I'm the one who goes before the Messiah, but I'm not here to save the world, right? And the, the wonderful and, and extraordinary thing about this passage is that John the Baptist comes out with a statement in which he says to his own disciples, he says, guys, I find my fulfillment, I find my contentment, and I find my joy in being what God has made me to be. And that's a pretty amazing statement, frankly. You ever, you ever found yourself looking at somebody else's life, looking at someone else, seeing what they are able to do, wishing you could be like them? Anybody else ever done that? Yeah? Envy versus contentment. is such a, a big thing in our Christian walk. You see, John, John didn't use this occasion as he could have. He could have used this occasion to bolster his own ego and self-importance, right? But instead, he's at ease. And it's an important point, and it's, it's a practical point, because there, there are so many, many uh, Christians that are not at ease with their gifts and their talents and their position that God has made them for. Whether, whether it's to be a, a, a mother and... And that is your calling, and, and that is your blessing. But you look and you go, I wish I had her life. Or whether that's a guy working in a factory or, or farming in the field, and he looks at the other guy and says, oh, I wish that was my life, right? You look and you see, and you want something else. And you want to maybe be someone else, or be somewhere else. And John is saying... I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. I'm happy with who God has made me to be. Look at the words he uses in verse 27. He says, A man can have nothing except what is given him from heaven. You understand what he's saying there? He's saying, I am perfectly at ease with the providence of God for what I am. And what I am is what God has made me to be. And what God has given to me. And he says, I find my joy in that. He says that in verse 29, right? He says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, the best man, right? He stands, he hears him, and rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. And then John adds a, a little comment here. Now John, the, the Apostle John, adds this little comment here. And it's so typical of, of John, the way he writes. And he speaks of, of what John is saying, the other John, John the Baptizer. He says, therefore, this joy of mine, it's complete. Or it's better. It's, it's full. He's content. John the Baptist is saying, I'm satisfied with who I am and my lot in life. I wasn't gifted nor given the role or call to be the Christ. That's not me. I don't even aspire to it. I'm happy with what God has done for me, with His providence. You see, God's plan in God's time, in God's way. That's what John is saying. And he's at peace with whatever that is. And, and actually, John's position in the divine economy of things and the history of redemption is a very important one. These words are said. It says, No one born of woman is greater than John. Jesus said that about John. But John is speaking to his disciples, these guys, these followers, who, who have picked up their lives and come to follow John, right? Right? 
And, and these guys are about to, about to start, cause a storm in the kingdom of God because they're feeling this tension, this rivalry that, that all of a sudden some guys are defecting to Jesus. Jesus is getting a following. They're starting to grow. We've kind of stagnated. What's going on here? And you can imagine how this conflict begins to brew between these two group of guys, right? And John says, there's nothing worse than always wanting to be someone else or wanting something else or wanting to be in someone else's marriage or in someone else's home or have someone else's income or or someone else's job or someone else's praise or their prestige or their power. And, And if you live your life in that way, always wanting what somebody else has that you don't have, if you're constantly looking to them, if you're constantly wishing I had that, if I need that, if I had that, if I wish I had that, if I was that, if I was there, if I was her, if I was him, that's misery. Torture yourself. Never being happy with who you are and who God created you to be. Never happy with what God has given you. That is the recipe for misery. And John cuts through it, right? And he says, a man can have nothing but that which has been given to him from heaven. Now, John may be speaking here about himself, but he may also be speaking about Jesus at this point. Saying that the the prestige and the honor and the dignity and and the following of of all these men and the numbers of disciples that are now going to Jesus, all of that is because God has given it to him. If God has chosen to bless him and God has chosen to give him, why, why should I be jealous of that? Who am I to complain? Why, why would I get worked up about God blessing somebody else? Who am I to get all prickly about that sort of thing? Because John realizes man can have nothing except for what God has given to him. And then he says, he must increase so that I might decrease. And that's an important lesson for each and every one of us. It's a very, very practical lesson for us. Because like, the truth of the matter is, some of us kind of need our prideful peacock feathers to be plucked a little bit, right? Because sometimes we get a little full of ourselves. We do. We're honest. And maybe you're used to getting your own way, right? Maybe you were raised that way, right? Your parents might have spoiled you. You had the things that the world could give you. You've, you've had jobs where you were in charge. That's your way of life. And you see, within the economy of the church of Jesus Christ, it doesn't work like that. Because you see, here's one of the secrets out of the Bible. Who is it who will become great? Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples? Remember when they said, Jesus, I want to sit at your right hand. No, me. I want to be your best. I want to be your best buddy. No, I want to sit at your right hand, right? These, these, these disciples of Jesus who had spent like three years of their lives learning at his feet have an argument over who gets to sit next to him, who gets to be his right hand man, right? What is Jesus' response to this argument among his disciples when they're like, who, who's, who's going to be your best dude, right? Who's going to be your best guy? Who, who's going to be your second in command? What does Jesus tell them? Who gets to sit at the head of the table? If you want to sit at the head of the table in Jesus' economy, you go down to the bottom of the table, right? That's the way to do it. Jesus wanted them to be servants. And so John says, He must increase. I must decrease. The way to grow in Christian life is to shrink in your estimation of yourself. We have to grow in grace, reduce in self, less about me and more about Jesus. But but notice in, in the passage in verse 31 and all the way down into 35 even, there's a connection now in this dialogue back to the conversation Jesus had earlier in in, in chapter 3 here in John with Nicodemus. Because Jesus is now referred to as the the one who came from above, and later in verse 31, as the one who came down from heaven. And do you see what, what John is doing here? 
Not only is he drawing attention away from himself, but he's drawing attention towards Christ, and he's exalting Christ while he does it. He says, the Father loves the Son. A beautiful little insertion into the text there. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Your life, your home, your family, your children, your circumstances, the hairs on your head, even if there's not very many of them there anymore, all of them, however many there are, are given into the hands of Jesus. Not into the hands of some distant, unknowable, unpredictable deity, but incarnate, God in flesh, Jesus who walked on the earth among us. Jesus who came and died for us. Into the hands of Jesus who went to the cross. Into the hands of Jesus who bore our sin, who took our shame. Into the hands of Jesus who went to be the ultimate sacrifice to redeem us. John says, God loves his son, and he's given all things into his hand. He gives, he says in 34, he gives the Spirit to him without limit. John the Baptist is still speaking, and he's saying, the Father loves the Son, and he's given to Jesus the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And in the divine economy of the covenant of grace, everything is put into the hands of the Son, in whom the Spirit dwells in His fullness. You see, as as Christ followers, we have the Holy Spirit. But we have a portion, a, a, a little bit. Jesus Christ Himself had a measureless anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, my friends, that's, that's a, a beautiful Christology that John shares with us here. Christianity is about Christ. Well, duh, yeah. And that's what John the Baptist is saying. And he's saying, it's not about me. It's not about ritual washings. It's not about baptism. It's not a, about those things. It's about Christ and the Lordship of Christ and our relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus is so much more than just a a moral teacher. Someone just to look up to. Someone who can just teach me maybe a few things about how to survive in this world. He's more than that. He demands our worship. He demands our all. And John is saying at the heart of the biblical message, at the heart of the history of redemption, the very middle of all of it is Jesus. Look to him. Don't look to me, John says. Look to him. Follow him. Give him everything. Because Jesus is central. Look to Jesus because he is Lord. Look to him because he is the Son of God. Look to him because the Father loves him. Look to him because the Spirit fully indwells within him. Look to him. Because he is the center of it all. Point number two today, if you're following along in your sermon notes, is this. Those who trust, believe, and rely upon Jesus, they already have eternal life. Look at the verse. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, right? Now, I don't know whether this is John the Baptist saying this, it's not in red letters. You know, red letters weren't in the original writings, right? Anybody, you, anybody like the red letter Bibles? I like the red letter Bibles. But I think this is probably actually John the Apostle making a comment here. And he's drawing a conclusion from all of this conversation that's been happening. And he's saying that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but instead will have the wrath of God remaining, abiding 
upon him. There are, there are consequences, my friends. There are consequences to saying no to Jesus. Hey, pastor, you know, I was coming to church hoping for something brilliant this morning, and you rolled that out, right? Thanks. But there are. There are consequences to saying no to Jesus. And it's easy to look down upon that statement. It's easy to try to over-complexify it. It's easy to overlook the simplicity of the gospel, of how personal it all is. It's easy to want to make this more sophisticated than it needs to be. Sometimes we simply overthink it. Sometimes we frankly just want to make it harder to get into the club, right? More rules to follow, more things to do, more of something before people can get in, right? But don't overcomplicate it. Like so many things in this life and in this world, simpler is better. I love simple things. I love studying the design of simple things. I love mouse traps. Not, well, I like them because they get rid of my mice problems. But they're simple and effective. <coughs> Study an inclined plane. Study a screw and the threading on a screw that goes into the wood, right? Can you make it simpler? Amazing engineering, though. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves simpler is better. And in this case, it is definitely better for us. And don't miss this. There is a, such wonderful, astonishing, mind-boggling, fantastic good news here. If you believe on the Son, you have eternal life. It's faith alone in Christ alone. Nothing more and nothing less. It's, it's not your baptism. Baptism is awesome. Baptism is great. We love baptisms. We're Baptists. But it's not your baptism. It's not your membership. We've been talking about joining this church. We've been telling people, hey, come be a member at Glory Baptist. But it's not your membership. It's not your giving, even though we just took an offering. It's not your giving. It's not taking communion. It's not about your, your ancestry or being in the right group of people. We bring nothing to it. And that's what John is saying. It's as simple as that. And the final point for you today is this. Those who reject Jesus are already under God's judgment. You see, there's this other side to this here. Whoever does not obey the Son, it says. If you don't believe, if you don't trust Him, if you don't follow Him, if you don't have a, a, a living, vital relationship with Jesus Christ, then the wrath of God remains. He's not saying it's coming. He's saying the wrath of God is already upon you. You are already under the wrath of God if you're not a believer. And it remains. When you die, the wrath of God remains upon you. When your soul survives death, the wrath of God remains upon you. When your body is resurrected on the last day and you're reunited with your soul, the wrath of God will be upon you. And, and upon you forever and ever for all of eternity. And I, I don't know about you, but that, that worries me a little bit. There's a lot of people I know that, that this will affect permanently. Eternally. It's, it's not what God wants. But without Jesus, it is what it will be. And that's why I'm so passionate about telling people about Jesus. That's why I care so much about our student programs, because at the younger ages of life, we know kids are more receptive to hear the gospel. That's why I care so much for those programs. That's why I try to preach meaningful and relevant messages every week so that when you invite your friends, when you invite your family here to Glory Baptist Church, you know that they will hear about Jesus. That's why we love to give away Bibles as a church. That's why we love to support missionaries to the ends of the earth. This is why we love to love and serve our neighbors in our community. It's this very thing. The idea that without Jesus, the world is lost. 
And the only way that they will find or hear about Jesus is through the local, local church and through believers like you and like me. And that belief is what should get us out of bed each and every morning. Every day that I draw a breath is an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus and then to model following Christ in my life. And I fully believe that God is up to some great and amazing things here at Glory Baptist Church. I'm more excited for this fall than I have been for any year that I've been here at this church. And I'm excited for this time because I know acutely the need around us is so great. Folks, there is so much brokenness. There is so much pain, addiction, and strife in our community and the areas surrounding us. Not just in the world, but here in our backyards, in Aiken and in the surrounding areas. And we have a chance to stand against that. God is empowering us, you and and me, this church, to be a lighthouse into a very dark world. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But I don't want it to shine alone. In darkness, a single candle can bring so much hope, right? One tiny flickering flame. (laughs) But lots of candles can help push away the darkness in so much greater ways. This week, after you leave here this morning, I want you to go forth into the world and shine brightly into that darkness, a darkness that surrounds us. Let the the, the love of Christ shine in you through all that you do, wherever you might go. Be bold in your faith. Be encouraged that God is with you and that He desires that none may perish. But it's up to us to share His love, the good news, to be Christ to the world around us, to those who the wrath is already upon. So that's your assignment this week. That's your marching orders. Not just today, but every day that you draw breath. Love others radically, generously, as Christ first loved you. Can you do that? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. And are humbled and amazed that you would choose people like us. God, we are sinners. We're all broken. We're all lost. We've all made mistakes. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Yet, you've chosen to use us as your ambassadors. You've redeemed us. You've forgiven us if we have put our hope and trust in you. And God, I just pray that in this week to come and in the weeks to come, that we would know that to our core. That you love us, that you forgive us, that you empower us if we put our hope and trust in you. And in that empowering, you have set us forth on a path to share with the world around us your great love. God, maybe there's some here today who've never understood that, who didn't know that, who didn't realize that they were living in your wrath. God, we don't say that to scare people. We say that to make people aware that without Jesus, there is no hope. But with Jesus, there is eternal hope. So on this day, Lord, all of us, every one of us, we just pause and reflect upon our lives. We turn over our lives to you, acknowledging that we are sinners in need of a Savior, saying, yes, Lord, I need you. I've made the mess of all of this. I can't clean it up. I can't fix it. Only you can. And then, God, if if we truly believe that you can give us eternal life, that you will and have forgiven us. If we accept that, that we can be in relationship with you, that you can be our Lord of our lives, then God, we can have eternal hope. Lord, as we go forth this week, 
May we go forth encouraged and empowered that we can go into the world and make a difference for your glory and your fame. We'll never do it perfectly, Lord, but may we do it boldly. When we fail, Lord, may we get back up and try it again. God, thank you for this chance to love the others in your name. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' high and holy and beautiful name. Amen. If you need some prayer, we'll have a prayer team here at the front. Come on down. They would love to pray with you. And uh, otherwise, go forth, serve your king. Have an awesome week. Thanks for coming to Glory Baptist Church. Jesus loves you. Have a great day. Thank you.